Okay, hello. So, uh, actually, this morning we received uh, six questions in the first two talks. So, thank you guys. This is the record, and especially for the test room. So, please keep it up. And also, don't forget to rate the lectures. So, we had two uh, database related uh, topics, and we continue in similar pace, just focusing on scalability. Who better to talk than um, a person from Google, actually? Yeah. Start. All right, I will wait a couple more seconds till the last one are seated. If I wait a little bit longer, maybe the room gets full, actually. Oh, it's looking pretty good already. All right, uh, good morning here in Belgrade. I'm really glad to be here. In this talk, I talk about Cloud Spanner, uh, which is a product of the Google Cloud Platform. A little bit about myself. I'm Robert Kubis. I'm a developer advocate. And we understand our job as like the bidirectional interface between you who built on top of our platform and the software developers that built this platform. So please, 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 please reach out to us. Um, to me personally, you see there, uh, you find me on Twitter under the uh, name Hosti Rosti. We really appreciate your feedback. The only way that we can make our products better and to be more open and to be uh, uh, more community driven is that you give us your feedback and we can actually implement that. All right, so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, Cloud Spanner. So these are basically the, the talking points that I have today. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the brief history. The how did we get about Cloud Spanner? Why did we build it in the first place? And then uh, talk a bit about use cases and where Cloud Spanner is a good fit and uh, like what kind of challenges it addresses. And I spend the majority of my time in how Spanner actually works behind the scenes and also showing you some demos uh, at the end. So let's start at going back basically to roughly 2005. Uh, back then, the Google business AdWords, where we made the majority of our money till today still, um, was on the back of a manual sharded MySQL. So it was sharded based on the customer ID, and we had to reshard the system several times. Now, the last reshard actually took several years. And you can imagine this wasn't a viable way going forward. Right? This business was growing rapidly from a 10 million a year to a billion a year business, and we just couldn't accept um, having this like, operational risk of our backing database to uh, bring down our business. So what did we actually need? We needed a system that is horizontal scalable. But we couldn't sacrifice on things like asset transactions. We were dealing with budgets, with money, with partners, with customers, with agencies. None of them would accept if we are eventually consistent. Right? The other thing is we couldn't accept any downtime. Like If we go down, not only we lose money, also our customers and partners lose money. And we were a business which was operating 24-7. So no matter if we had to do security patches, if we had to do software upgrades, hardware upgrades, things like that, all these were not accepting, uh, acceptable to bring down our backing database. So we built the system in around 2007, 2008 internally, and we are running it for almost 10 years now inside of Google. So it has been proven like, in a lot of scenarios. And we bring actually this system that we have built internally uh, and now make it available to everyone who is using Google Cloud Platform. So what are the things that are really important making this step and this transition from an internal system to a system that we can make available for, for everyone? And one of the first things, of course, was this is a fully managed system. So, and I'm going to show that in a little demo later, um, you basically can operate it with a REST API from our developer console, but it's fully managed. We take care of all the nitty gritties behind the scenes. And I'll talk a little bit about how we make that possible. Um, 
Also very important for us was already internal when we built the system. We wanted to tap into the, into the knowledge and the experience of our like, database admins, database developers, right? So they knew relational database inside out, and we didn't want to put like, in front of them a completely different system. Um, so it was really important for us that this database system also adheres to the relational semantics that you're known to form like a MySQL system or Postgres system. Um, since it's distributed system, uh, very important there as well that it's synchronous uh, replicated across the globe, and all this is done automatically. Now, another point which was really important for us is, and which hasn't been that elaborately developed inside of Google when we were using it internally, but once we made it available for the outside, we wanted to have it integrated with a lot of languages and tools that are out there. So we spent quite a fair amount of time during our early access program to make sure that we have like, the major languages, client libraries, and that they are automatic um, to the extent we can do things like that, um, that we provide a GDBC driver. Currently, it's a read-only GDBC driver, but even the read-only GDBC driver enabled a wide range of BI tools to connect to Cloud Spanner. Now, we get asked very often, like, how does Cloud Spanner compare to a traditional database system or to a NoSQL system? And most of the time when we get compared to a traditional database system, then you think of like your either single host MySQL or Postgres database. Or if you're a little bit more advanced, you think about a MySQL with a failover and read replicas. Now, I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we can't accept is downtime. Now, if you have a single host um, MySQL with a read replica and failover instances, if you want to do updates, software updates, security patches, things like that, even though it's a planned outage or a planned failover that you do, you have to fail over to your failover instance. And you will incur some, some downtime in, uh, during this time, even if it's very little and it's planned. It's still downtime. Um, also, if you look at like a NoSQL system, most of the time, like a lot of companies start out with a traditional relational database system, and then they outcode the system either on the read-writes or on, on the capacity that these databases can, can hold for them. And for them, the immutable requirement is a horizontally scalability. So they resort to a NoSQL system, but they, by that, give most of the times up the transactional capabilities. Right? So you build, basically have to build these transactional capabilities and bring them into your application layer and work around the lack of these features in your underlying database system. So if you look at Cloud Spanner, it combines basically the, the strong features that you see in a relational database system, a traditional relational database system, with the scalability of a NoSQL database. So typical workloads, and I just want to briefly touch on this, um, that you see for the use of Spanner are around the like, shortcomings of both of these systems that I just mentioned, like the traditional relational database system or the, the NoSQL systems. So one of the things, if, if you look at, for instance, if you outcode your your relation, relational database on, on data size, like if you go over a couple of terabytes or tens of terabytes, you will get like really in the, into the area where it's really hard to manage the system. You have to shard the system and things like that. Now, this is one point where Spanner shines. Spanner can scale to tens to hundreds of terabytes. Another thing is like if you if you run into the like capacity issues in terms of read and writes. Right? If you have a shorted MySQL, you can free up, or if you have a, a MySQL setup with read replicas, you can free up your master of like, the uh, read capacity and give that to the read replicas to free up a little bit of capacity for your writes. But you will hit a ceiling. Like, you basically can only scale your master vertically. So another thing for Cloud Spanner, and that's a very prime use case, is if you need scalability on the read and writes uh, in your transactions. Because, again, Cloud Spanner scales there horizontally with the nodes that you have. 
Another important use case is if you have a mission-critical database. So if you can accept or can't accept any downtime, if you need a system that is like four nines or five nines available, that's another use case for Cloud Spanner. Even if you have small amounts of data, if you have ten of tens or hundreds of gigabytes of data, Cloud Spanner is a good fit for this if you need a mission-critical database. And since it's scaling very well on read-writes as well on storage, you can also use Cloud Spanner to consolidate uh, multiple databases. So think of you have a MySQL database to store some user information, and you have like a Cassandra or MongoDB to store, for instance, log information or audit log information. And you want to bring that together. Usually what you do is you have an ETL job, bring this together, and do some analytics over it. Now with Cloud Spanner, you, you are unable to bring these data like right at the beginning into one database. All right, so this is about like, the capabilities of Cloud Spanner. Um, now I want to go into the architecture and how Cloud Spanner actually works under the hood. And to bring everybody on the same page, what I'm going to talk about, I want to basically relay some terminology to you. So everything starts with an instance. An instance is basically the resource pool that you're getting if you create a Cloud Spanner instance. You define how many nodes you want to have, and we have per node you can store to two terabytes of, of data. So that's like what we give as a recommendation. Now in this instance, you can create up to 100 databases. Just like a database, as you know, from like MySQL or any like big vendor database. And then in each of these uh, databases, you can create up to 2048 tables. Now, these are the concepts that everybody knows from relational database system and that everybody can see from the outside. But to enable scalability under the hood, to enable scalability on compute as well as on storage, we have another concept underneath internally, which we call splits. And splits is nothing else than uh, splitting these tables that you have lexicographically, so by, by primary key. So imagine you have a primary key with some numbers and letters, and we basically take ranges of that and say, okay, this is one split, another, the next range, this is another split, and so on. And this enables us to, to scale. Now, how do we do this? We do this in a way that we separate compute from storage in, in Cloud Spanner. And we distribute this database. So if you get a regional instance from us, for one node that you buy from us, you get three nodes in three, in, in three zones, over three zones. So one, one Spanner node is actually three compute nodes for a regional instance. And uh, like they have also their dedicated storage in these zones. Now. When you want to deal with this data, and if you want to basically ensure that you have global consistency, we need something, we need some mechanism to ensure that there's never two owners of like one of these splits. So the way that we are doing this is actually we are using the Paxos algorithm. So Paxos is an algorithm which helps you to, to elect a leader, and then we have a functionality or we have something that we call true time to ensure that there's never two Paxos groups responsible for, for a split. So how does it actually look like in more, more detail? I'm going to go into that in a minute. But before, I want to talk about true time a bit. So what is actually true time? So imagine you talk to your neighbor right now, and you synchronize your watches. And then you go off, and you come back in a week and you compare your watches again. You will see that your watches have thrifted. And that has multiple reasons. Like you have been to different places, there are different cosmic rays, there are different temperatures, and things like that, which all basically let your watches thrift. Now to make sure that we actually have only one Paxos group responsible for a split, what we need is like a global wall clock time. We need something that we can trust all over the world because this database is distributed over multiple zones or even over the globe. So we need something that we can trust, where we can make sure if the time has passed, it has actually passed all over the world, or a time that has not passed all over the world. So since this is a really hard problem 
to create this, this global workload time. We invented something that we call true time. And with true time, you don't get a single timestamp. You actually get an interval. And that interval describes something really cool. So the interval describes basically the lower bound describes that this timestamp that you get in the lower bound has passed all over the world. And the upper timestamp that you get, the upper bound, is a timestamp that has passed nowhere in the world. And you can trust these. So now with this semantic, you actually can use this to make sure that there's never, ever, ever, ever two Paxos groups which are responsible for the same split. And by that, we can ensure that we have global consistency. Now, how do we make this possible, and how do we make sure that this interval is as small as possible? Because you can imagine if this interval is big, if this is like hundreds of milliseconds, we have to wait out a lot of time, all the time, everywhere, to basically make sure that we are the only ones that are responsible. So we want to keep this interval as small as possible. Now, the way that we're doing this in Google is we have all over the world in our data centers GPS time masters and atomic time masters, so atomic clocks installed all over the world in our data centers. Now, we use GPS to synchronize our atomic clocks all over the world in our data centers. And then if we request a true time, time interval, we basically ask a subset of these time masters, which consists of atomic masters and GPS masters, and basically ask for this interval. Now, if we have any outliers in the subset that we ask, we basically just throw that out and say, like, we don't trust that time master anymore. Now, we have to make sure that these are synchronized in somewhat in intervals. And you see behind me, the, the clock drifts about 200 microseconds a second. Right? So we are synchronizing these clocks basically every 30 seconds, and we can stay within a single digit millisecond range of this interval. So that's actually pretty good and helps us a lot like, in terms of like, the performance that we can achieve with the database. Now, some of you might ask, like, OK, what, is, what if all our time masters fail in the data center? Does this database come to a grinding halt and risk my business? No, it doesn't. And it doesn't because we can still ask the time masters from a different data center. But we will like, basically incorporate all the latencies that we incur by traveling to the next to the other data center and getting this timestamp. So basically, our interval will grow. Our interval will get bigger, maybe like tens of milliseconds or like 100 milliseconds. But it will only slow down the database. It will not bring it to a halt. So let me explain a little bit on, based on a life of a query, how, how all this works in terms of like, my Paxos leader and followers and how I do transactions and things like that. So first, I want to start with a consistent read. So you see, uh, I didn't change the name of the event. I apologize for that, but I, this event was yesterday, and I didn't have time. To change it. But anyway, so basically, I have here a select statement which selects all, let's say, talks from an event which is here in this call, in this case called Cloud Summit. Now, if the client sends this request through a client library or a REST API or things like that, or GP, gRPC, that what we are supporting, and it comes in through a replica, like a follower. This follower will be basically in this Paxos group, and let's assume this this request can be answered by one Paxos group. We just idolize this here. Um, in that case, basically what the follower is doing in this uh, Paxos group is asking, since we want to have a consistent read, it's asking the leader of this Paxos group, like, hey, am I up to date? If the leader responds with, like, yeah, that is my last timestamp that I have for this data, the follower basically compares, like, says, like, OK, I have that latest data and can return the data to your client. Now, in the case that you have a request where the follower doesn't have the latest data, what happens is basically the, the leader will tell the follower and say, like, hey, please wait out some time. Um, the data is already in flight. So just wait till you see this timestamp in your data, and then you can respond with the data to your client. And that's basically what the follower will do. It will wait, and then it will respond with the data. 
Now, something really cool in Cloud Spanner is that you can do so-called stale consistent reads. And they're really powerful, especially if you have a database which is distributed globally. So imagine you have your read-write quorum in the US, and then you have a read replica in Europe and a read replica in Asia. Now, you have some customers coming in in Europe, and you don't really care that they get the latest data, but you care that they see a consistent world. In that case, what you can do is a so-called time-bound stale consistent read. So you basically, your client can say, OK, I accept data which is up to 15 seconds old. So that's what I'm going to do here. And if you do 15 seconds in like most, 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 most cases, um, you will have the data in, in your replica already. So the data is most likely, most, most, most likely, already in your replica. So the, the, the follower, basically, or the replica can already say, like, OK, I have that data which, which qualifies for the request of 15 seconds staleness and can re respond directly. So this lowers, ex especially if you are globally distributed, this lowers like the response time uh, dramatically. Now, if you have a read-write transaction, what happens is in a read-write transaction, you definitely need to have the leader of your Paxos group involved. So you basically go directly, your request is directly routed to the leader of this Paxos group, and you do your read. Uh, at that point, we ac uh, acquire some logs. We respond with the query result to the client. The client does some changes, like some modification updates. And then sends, basically sends back the transaction, says, like, hey, I want to commit this change now. At that point, the leader of the Paxos group sends out the values to the followers. And as soon as it gets back the majority from the followers that they have written that data, it can release the logs and then send back a uh, commit acknowledge to, to the client. So this is like how basically under the hood Spanner works with queries and transactions. Now, I talked, we are concentrating on one Paxos group in this scenario. Now, I mentioned that we are actually splitting a table in multiple split to enable distribution and enter, uh, enable horizontal scalability. Now, if you have a transaction that involves multiple Paxos groups, we basically use a two-phase commit protocol between this Paxos group to ensure the, the consistency, global consistency. If you look at the data layout, the data format in Cloud Spanner. It's just like you know from a traditional relational database system. So you have tables, which have columns, which are strongly typed. But we have, don't have semantics like foreign key constraints. We don't have things like triggers or stored procedures or user-defined functions. So it is not a lift and shift from a MySQL or Postgres system or any like bigger render database if you basically want to make this transition to Cloud Spanner. You have, especially if you use these constructs, you have to do some redesigning. Now we know that there are certain queries where, which can really benefit from data locality in the sense of that they are living in the same split. So we have something which I would call foreign key constraint minus minus. And that is called interleaving. So just as an example here, I have a table, a singers table, and an albums table, um, which have some data in there. And that, of course, if you want to ask, like, OK, what are the albums for, for a certain singer, you would always do this join. So especially if you do this join very, very often, you want to co-locate this data. So what you can do is interleaving, which is displayed here. So basically what happens is, you interleave these child rows into the parent rows. So like my singers table is my parent table. And for each row in my singers table, I want to store the albums co-located. So we use interleaving for this. And the way that is done in, in uh, DDL is here. You basically just define and say interleave in singers. And the requirement is that you share the primary key so that the child table has to prefix the primary key of the parent table. Now, you can do this in multiple levels, but you should be careful with doing this, uh, not overdoing this. And the reason for this is 
since all of this, like each row, basically each parent row, stores all the child rows in the same split, you might end up with either storage capacity uh, issues or uh, scalability issues. And the scalability issues in the sense of if you have a lot of data there, you might be hotspotting on this split. So you want to be careful like where it makes sense and where you maybe design it a little different. Another aspect that I briefly mentioned already is that we support online schema updates. So now no downtime schema updates. So you can alter your table, add columns, things like that in a transaction with Cloud Spanner. So basically make, um, without incurring any downtime. So what are a couple of don'ts in a distributed database system, or especially also for the Cloud Spanner database system? So if you come from MySQL or Postgres, and you use this nice feature of an auto increment primary key, this is a don't, don't, don't in, in Cloud Spanner. So you don't want to have something that is monotonically increasing, like an integer or a timestamp or things like that. So just to demonstrate this here, or go a little bit more in detail, what would happen if you have an, an increasing timestamp, let's say like last access timestamp, and you have a lot of access, a lot of updates on this table, you basically send all your data with this primary key to one split, and you're hotspotting on that one split. And now this, this like compute node hotspots basically gets overloaded, and your database um, slows down. Even so, like, the entire utilization of your database might be very low. So one way to do this, or there are multiple ways to overcome this and address this. One way is you use UIDs, version 4 plus, as a primary key. Or if you, uh, what you also can do is you prefix with a sharding ID. So depending on like how much load you're going to have on this table, you basically define a range of sharding IDs and prefix it with a sharding ID. So how would that look like here? So basically, we added a sharding ID here. And now you can see, even though we have um, monotonically increasing timestamps, we can distribute the load over multiple splits. And by that, multiple compute nodes can be responsible for these splits. And by that, we, we uh, distribute the load nicely. All right. With this, I want to show a little bit like how, how Spanner works and where you can find some more information. So everything starts basically um, with documentation. And like, if you want to know more and uh, like, read some white papers around it, your starting point is cloud.google.com slash Spanner, where you find like, comparisons as well as like, white papers, especially if you come from uh, MySQL database system, a sharded MySQL base database system, I want to point out the Cloud Spanner case study, which is uh, from Quizlet that moved from a sharded MySQL to Spanner. And they talk in very technical detail uh, what, what schema modifications and considerations they had to do to migrate to Cloud Spanner. There's also. Um, what we get asked like many times is about the cap theorem. Does Spanner defeat the cap theorem? And I can take that away that we don't defeat the cap theorem. I will go a little bit more detail at the end of my talk. But if you want to read about it, like Eric Brewer uh, published a white paper where he elaborates on the view of like how the cap theorem and Spanner work together. All right. We have also a lot of like, white papers in our documentation which talk about like, best practices for schemas and things like that. But I want to show you how you can actually get started. So we have a free trial that you can uh, use, uh, which is $300 if you sign up for Google Cloud Platform. And then you just type in Spanner in your like, search box, or you go into the hamburger men menu on the left that you see here, and you can find Spanner there. And as mentioned, this is a fully managed system. So I basically just type a name, select a region, in this case, Europe, and I say how many nodes I want to have, and I click Create. And within seconds, you have a database at your disposal. Now I can start and either use the client libraries and create my schema through the client libraries. If you just want to play with it, 
I can also create a database here and create a schema in the console. So let's add a table, somebody, uh, for instance, singer. And I add a column. Age integer is good. I select the primary key. I click create. And then within a couple of seconds, I have my schema available. So that's pretty straightforward, as you would expect it from a different database. Now I mentioned you can do uh, live online schema updates. So what I want to do here is I want to edit my table. And for instance, add a name column. Say save. And then you will see that there's a box coming up at the top which basically says like, okay, like there's a schema update in progress and that will be transactional um, done behind the scenes. All right. Now for for my demo purposes, I I have example schema. So I built a demo for for our keynote of our uh, conference that we have all over the world. And what I have there is I wanted to have like a ticket broker system. Now imagine you have like event organizers that want to sell tickets for like games or like shows or things like that, and you have customers and fans all over the world that want to buy these tickets. Now it's obvious that it's really important that you don't sell a ticket twice or that you charge a customer twice. So you want to have a system that is globally consistent and that it is transactional. Now in this example I have basically a schema where we have like multi-events. So multi-events you can think of like a, a tourney, like a tour of a, of a star, right? And then we have events which are part of this tour. These events have to happen in a venue. So we have like a venue table. These venues have different seating categories for like, for instance, like general admission and uh, premium seating and VIP seating and things like that. And you have all kinds of like information. Now you see like this is just a traditional relational database schema. There's nothing in there which suggests like charting or distribution. It's all done behind the scenes. You, it's not exposed to the user. And you can still do the things like that you're used to in terms of like doing joins and uh, also transactions across multiple tables. So now I have this um, schema, and the first thing that I want to do is I want to create an account in this schema. So the way I do this is I start, and if you have the Google Cloud SDK installed, or if you're running your application on a Google Compute Engine, you have already a default application authentication context. So I actually can use this in my application. So what I'm doing here is basically I do the Google credentials to get application default, and that is basically my authentication context. So with like five lines here, I'm done. Like if anything happens, I just scream and print it print the stack trace and then return, right? Now the next thing that I need is I need to define like which instance do I want to talk to, which database do I want to talk to. So I have um, spanner client tab, so basically where I build my options and then I say okay my instance ID is spanner EU and my database is, is demo. Now from my authentication context, I also bring that in basically. It's auto automatically picked, picked up. Um, I already get like the project ID which I also need to connect to my database. So see here down here in the database client, I basically need, need the project ID, instance ID, and the demo, uh, the database ID to connect. Now um, you might ask like, okay, like this is amazing if you develop from your laptop or if you run it on a Google Compute Engine, what if like I connect from somewhere else, a different cloud provider or a different system on premise or something like that. Of course we support that as well. Um, like you can use a service account where you can create a JSON key or P12 key which you can use to authenticate against uh, Spanner with Java client. Now the next thing that I want to do is I want to do a read only transaction. Oh. That was too early. So the fir first thing that I want to do is, of course, the read-only transaction. So basically, I get my 
client, I say, OK, this is a single use read only transaction, which has advantages of that I don't need to acquire any locks in Spanner. So I can just run that and like, don't block any, any write transactions or things like that, which is pretty amazing. And um, then I basically build my statement, as you would expect it from any other database. I have like some parameter markers. So in this case, I want to select all multi-events which are happening right now till tomorrow in 24 hours. And I use some parameter markers in my SQL statement, and then I basically bind these parameters at the bottom with the bind. And then I just execute it, and I still need to display some results. So I basically iterate through my result set, as you can see here, and I can point to the results either by position or by, by name from my uh, SQL statement. So let's run this. And if the demo gods are nice with me, then you see down here at the bottom that I got like my 10 multi-events. All right. So I mentioned that I actually create an account. That's the next step. I apologize. So this is actually the read. Now, um, there's one thing I talked about, the timestamp-bound queries, where I can do stale, consistent reads. And that I can also do already with the single read, uh, read-only transaction. So I can actually add the uh, time spent bound, where I can say, OK, I have a timestamp bound object where I create one of the max staleness. And I say, like, OK, what's my time unit and how many uh, units of this time units do I want to have? So in this case, I say I want to have uh, run a transaction, or a read-only transaction, which accepts a staleness of 15 seconds. So it's basically just one line edit. And I run this again, and if everything works, basically I will get the same result. Now, let's have a look at the uh, write transaction. So in this case, I do a write-only transaction. So again, I instantiate my client. It's the same that we just saw. And then I create a mutation down here, as you can see. So basically, in this mutation, we don't have currently DML. We don't have like insert SQL. So if you write to the database, if you do updates, you need to use our, our client libraries. Our, um, yeah. So in this case, we create a mutation. And here, I want to create an account, where I have an account ID, a name, like a, an email, and things like that. Now I want to elaborate a little bit on the mutation notation. In Spanner, there is a mutation limit per transaction of 20,000 mutations. Now, a mutation is not like one row, one mutation. A mutation is actually any cell in the database that you are changing. What does that mean? If you have a table with five columns and you insert a row into this table, you have five mutations because you change five columns in that table. Now, if you have an index, defined on this table. For instance, you, you do an index over two additional rows, uh, two additional columns in this table. You add an additional two mutations. So basically, if you then insert an, or update a row, you have seven mutations. So this is really important if you run into this mutation limit and you like, like I, I only changed 1,000 rows. Why do I run into the 20,000 mutations limit? Think about of like how many cells you are actually changing with your transaction. So that's really important. And then basically, I use this mutation, this list of mutations. And if I do a write-only transaction, I just can send this to the write function of my client and run this. So I run this here. And in this case, I get a timestamp back when this was committed. And we can check here if I go to my demo instance and I go to my accounts, you will now see that I have my account created. All right, so this was successful. So next thing, what I want to do is a read-write transaction. So read-write transaction is a little bit more complex in the sense of that we use a concept that might not be like super intuitive at first. So what we are doing here is actually we, uh, we obtain the read-write transaction context and then uh, run this, uh, like, uh, um, 
execute the run function. And this run function expects actually a transaction callable. So we create this transaction callable. And the reason that we are expecting this is because the client library actually does reruns of transactions. So to be able to rerun your transaction uh, seamlessly without you having to take care of like reruns if the transaction fails, we actually need the entire things that you're doing in your transaction. So you create this transaction callable and create a run function in there which where you create your either you use like our read APIs or you use an SQL statement to do your reads and then you do again with mutations you do your updates. So in my case here I select my account that I just created and then I just change the name from Robert to Spanner Guru, Guru here. And then again, I add this to my transaction, and then this is run in this uh, transaction callable. Now, if we run this again, you're going to see here. that I have my data changed. Right, so this worked. Now you can also do edits in the console. Um, this is usually if you play around or do some POCs, very helpful. I'm just going to use this here to do my deletes. Um, and then I'm basically done. All right. So I mentioned I want to talk a little bit more about the cap theorem. So who has not heard of the cap theorem here? before in the room. All right, there are a couple. OK, so the cap theorem basically uh, describes how distributed systems can be consistent, available in the case of partition. And then basically describes like the different kinds of systems if they resolve to result to either being available in the case of that there is a split brain, so if you have a network partition, or if they are consistent in the case of a network partition. So basically, you have these three categories of systems. You have an AP system, which is basically available in the case of a partition. You have the CP systems, which are consistent, which result to consistency in the case of, of partitioning. And then you have CA systems. Well, they don't really exist. Who claims to have a CA system? Don't trust them. A CCCA system is basically a single host system where you don't have any network uh, involved and where you basically don't have the possibility of a split brain. If you have a split brain, you can't be available and consistent at the same time. So and that is also the case, like, I mean, some might ask, like, okay, does Spanner actually defeat the, uh, the cap theorem? And no, we don't. Now, Spanner results to a CP system. We are consistent in the, in the case of a partitioning. So if, if we have a split brain where we don't have the majorities anymore, we result to consistently and we become unavailable. Um, that's just like the, what the, the quality criteria that we put on ourselves in terms of being a global consistent uh, database system. We can't provide availability in the case of a split brain. Now, there's one caveat to it, or like maybe not a caveat, but there's one aspect to it. And the aspect is, if, if your infrastructure, or your underlying infrastructure and the architecture is really, really good, the, the possibility of a split brain is, is minimized. And it actually hasn't happened yet inside of Google on our spanner system that we had to result to consistency and became unavailable. Right? And this is because of like, the networks that we have, where we have redundancy and paths and things like that. So it hasn't happened that actually um, we had a split brain in the sense of that we had to bring down Cloud Spanner. All right. So with this, um, if you want to try it, please find uh, our free tier on Google Cloud Platform. And I appreciate any feedback. And I would be also open for any questions right now if you have them. Yes, actually, we have uh, many questions. I will. I mean, we can cover uh, maybe two. How does Spanner handle case when nodes are distributed globally in different regions? How do you handle latency and consistency in that case? Yeah. All right. So um, Spanner is always consistent. Uh, now, in terms of latencies, 
if you think of a globally distributed database in case of Spanner, you basically have a read-write quorum. So basically, all your read-write um, Paxos groups, which are responsible for, the, for, for your splits, are somewhat close together. So if you have a multi-regional database, you have like data centers which are a couple of hundred, maybe 100 kilometers apart, but the latencies are very low between them. And they have the read-write quorum. Now, if you distribute it to yeah, like Europe and Asia, you have only read replicas in Europe and Asia. Now, what that does that mean for latencies? It basically, if you have a write transaction or any kind of trans like, uh, transaction which needs a strong consistency, and you come in through one of these read replicas, you have to go to the US to make sure you le read the latest data or you do your writes. So you will incur the physical bound latencies that we have there. Now, between all our data centers, we own actually the network. So the latencies are as low as it possibly gets by the law of physics. But you will have like these latencies. Now, if you co-locate it to the read-write room, like your latencies are, are really low. So you can get in, in single digit milliseconds latencies. One more. On which database is Spanner based on? Uh, database, uh, Spanner is not based on any database. This is a complete uh, new build from, from scratch in-house inside Google. And one last one is Spanner CP or CA? So as mentioned, uh, CA is not possible. Um, who claims to be CA? Um, call him a liar. Uh, we are a CP system. Okay, we have one more, so I will read it. Um, how does Spanner handle schema changes that uh, lock entire tables in other SQL implementations? Example, adding a non-nullable field with a default value. Um, non-nullable fields. So this is a bit tricky question. So basically, as mentioned, schema changes are online, um, and they are handled in a transaction. So they're not like locking your table. Uh, but if you have something like you need a default value or not null, it's a little bit more tricky. You basically have to add a column, load all your existing rows with your default value, and then change this column to not null. You can do this, but that's the only thing, only way that you can do it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much.